Environmental health focuses on factors that cause disease. So what is disease? That's any abnormal change in the condition of a body that impairs physical or psychological function. So that's a pretty broad term. And there are many potential causes in the environment for disease. These could be elements of our natural world. These could be social, cultural, or technological considerations that affect individuals and cause disease. One common cause of disease are pathogens. So these are any organism that cause disease. So the most common ones you would think of would be viruses and bacteria, but there are many other organisms that are classified as pathogens. The greatest loss of life from a pathogen in a single year was in 1918 with the influ influenza pandemic. So this is a virus particularly that causes the flu that was widespread in that year. Here we're looking in two columns at causes of disease in 1990 and 2020. So this is a projection into the future here. We see that communicable diseases um, were particularly prominent 25 years ago and are still quite high um, in our disease burden, things that cause disease across the globe, but these things have reduced. So diarrhea has a variety of causes in the environment. These could be um, poor water quality, poor sanitation, uh, many things that can cause diarrhea, which can be very severe if you don't have um, access to medical care. Other things like perinatal conditions have also decreased, so these are um, things that affect either the mother or the offspring right after birth. And we see other environmental sort of diseases, so things not caused by pathogens per se, but maybe by lifestyle or other aspects of the environment like depression and heart disease, these things have moved up considerably in rank over uh, the last 30 years and in this projection. So in addition to humans, other organisms get diseases and we look at those in the field of conservation medicine. So this combines ecology as well as healthcare. So wildlife experience disease and sometimes these diseases become widespread and epidemic sometimes called ecological diseases. And these are important to us because the balances that would be disrupted in the ecology by these diseases have negative impacts on the environment, which have negative impacts on human health. So there are many things we depend on in the environment for our health, and these ecological diseases can harm those processes. So conservation medicine attempts to understand how changes in the environment threaten not only human health, but also the health and functioning of natural communities that we depend on. So another thing that can cause disease other than a pathogen are toxins. You can think of this as a synonym for poison. So this is any substance that damages or kills an organism. Toxins can be harmful even in very dilute concentrations. Some of them are naturally occurring, like minerals or compounds that are produced by organisms. Other toxins are synthesized by humans, so manufactured in some way. Some of these toxins, particularly synthesized toxins, take a really long time to break down in the environment. We call these persistent organic pollutants, or POPs. So the field of toxicology studies the effects of external factors like toxins on both organisms, individuals, and systems, interacting individuals. Toxicology includes environmental factors like chemicals, drugs, or an individual's diet, as well as physical factors like solar radiation, UV light, and electromagnetic forces that might also have adverse effects on organisms. 
A subfield of toxicology is environmental toxicology, and this specifically deals with the biosphere, so how toxins interact in that environment, how they are transformed, and how they affect uh, individuals and larger functions of the biosphere. So we're looking at individuals as well as populations and whole ecosystems. One particular persistent organic pollutant is DDT. You've probably heard of this. It was a common pesticide used in uh, the 1900s, 1950 to 1980 or so. It's still used in other places. This is when it was prominent in the United States. So extensively used to control insects. It does a great job of killing insects. It also has negative effects on other organisms, which is why it was banned. And one thing that will help you understand the following figure is that DDT, the molecule that we actually spray into the environment, is converted into DDE. It's just a different uh, molecular structure. It's transformed in the soil by microbes there. Both forms are toxic, um, just a slightly different structure there in DDE. Okay, so as you probably have heard, DDT and DDE were particularly harmful for raptor populations, these large birds. So here we're looking at, over time, uh, two y-axes, the mean number of young per breeding area, which is our blue line, and the DDE concentration in eagle eggs, which is the red line. So you can see a correlation here. When DDE is high, mean number is low, as DDE prevalence in eggs decreases, we see an increase in mean number of young eagles per breeding area. This figure also shows us that when that DDT was banned in the United States, and so it had already been decreasing for some time before the ban, after the ban we see this significant decrease in DDT prevalence in eagle eggs. And even after some number of years, six or ten years, we haven't regained here the mean number um, that we had before DDT was used, but getting close. So this figure shows us a correlation between DDE residue in eggs and the mean number of young per breeding area, but we don't necessarily know based on this data, these data, whether this relationship shows us a causation or if it's simply a correlation and something else is driving the changes in mean number per breeding area, something else other than DDE. So I want you to take a moment, pause the video, think about how you might design an experiment to directly test whether DDT or DDE is affecting survivorship of raptor chicks. So take a few minutes and think about that and then restart the video. So hopefully you've thought about a study and put it on your pre-activity sheet. I'll give you an example of a study that was conducted to uh, better understand this relationship. So in American kestrels, which is another raptor, they fed female birds different mice that had been laced with different amounts of DDE, and then measured the thickness of eggshells, or rather the thinness, so how uh, much thinner were eggshells from these mothers relative to eggshells of mothers that received no DDE. So you can see that as DDE uh, exposure increases, DD, or excuse me, eggshell thinning increases. So thinner shells with more DDE, that's a direct relationship which we um, can understand. So further study shows us that it's calcium deposition that is inhibited by prevalence of DDE in those eggshells. So eggshells are thinner, individuals are less likely to survive, uh, to hatch. So if we looked in the environment, we would see that DDT concentration was very low, but we see high concentrations of DDT, DDE in the bodies of raptors. And one question, one ecological principle is answered by the question, what accounts for those high concentrations of DDE in the bodies of raptors? And that's something you'll explore in the second part of the pre-activity. 
The last thing I want to cover here is how we measure toxicity. So the basic principle, or one basic principle, of the field of toxicology is that the dose makes the poison. So almost everything is toxic at high levels, but could also be safe if it is sufficiently diluted. There's also the complication that how something is, is administered and at what rate that thing is administered also play a role in how toxic it can be. So is the material absorbed through the skin? Is it ingested? Is it breathed in? Is it all at once? Is it over a whole lifetime? There are many different variables that go into determining whether something is or is not toxic. So similar to the tolerance curve that we looked at when we talked about ecology, we could look at a similar thing with um, toxicity. So here we've got a dose and hypothetical units and the number of individuals that respond to that dose. So you can see that we have a few individuals that are very sensitive, they respond at a low dose. A few individuals that are very insensitive, they respond at a, they only respond at a high dose. And then most of the population is somewhere in the middle, responding at some intermediate dose. So how do we determine whether something is toxic or how do we put that into words? What do we um, use to measure whether something is dangerous or toxic? One common measurement is the dose to which 50% of the population is sensitive. And if we're measuring sensitivity as death, we would call this the lethal dose or the LD50. So the dose at which 50% of the population dies. So here's a curve that displays that. We've got dose and hypothetical units. We'll look at some real units shortly. The percentage of the population that is killed by that dose. So if we look at the dose that kills 50% of the population, it's over here. So a hypothetical dose of 3.5 units is our LD50, the dose at which 50% of the individuals in the population die. This curve also shows us what the tolerance curve showed us. So we see that there are a low percentage of individuals that are killed by a low dose. And then we reach some threshold at which even a little increase in dose significantly increases the percentage killed. And then here at the very top, there are a few individuals that hang on even at a really high dose. Similar to the LD50 is the ED50. So this is measuring instead of a lethal dose, the effective dose. What dose is required to see a response? So we can use this for a wide range of responses like stunted growth of offspring, reduced enzymatic activity, hair loss, all kinds of things. When whatever response we set it at, the ED50 tells us the dose at which we see that response in 50% of the individuals. So again, we've got percent of individuals here. Here's 50%, I've already circled the ED50. And I told you that we've got a more meaningful dose unit here. So this is the dose measured as milligrams per kilograms of body weight. So how much toxin is given relative to how big that individual is. So this is really important. I'm sure it's fairly intuitive to you that a, a, the same size dose on a horse would have a different effect as the dose of that same dose on a rabbit or something very small. So it's important to take into consideration the size of the organism when we're thinking about effective or lethal doses. So that's the end of this screencast lecture. Use the posted slides in your textbook to finish part B of the pre-class worksheet, which is due at the beginning of class. And then in class, we'll follow up on these topics with a case study on another persistent organic pollutant.